We start with the Colorado River, the lifeblood of the West, serving more than 40 million people in seven Western states, including Arizona. A new report titled Dancing with Deadpool delivers an unflinching assessment of the Colorado's health that should concern all of us. Here's a take, here's a quote. Conditions on the Colorado River are, to put it bluntly, dire. The basin is out of time. The crisis is no longer theoretical. Joining us now are two Arizona water experts with decades of experience. They contributed a chapter to that report. Catherine Sorensen, former director of Phoenix's Water Services Department, is now research director at ASU's Kyle Center for Water Policy. Sarah Porter is director of the Kyle Center for Water Policy. Welcome back to Square Off. Nice to be here. Good Thank to be you. With you. First off, I need you to explain the title of this report. It is not a new movie from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Dancing with Deadpool. What does that mean? Well, Deadpool is a condition behind a dam um, below which water cannot be released from the dam. So what it means is that the, the amount of water in the dam is dead. You can't get it back out of the dam. So um, I think the title is indicative of the fact that we're at really low storage levels behind Lake Powell and Lake Mead, and we are at risk of, of running into Deadpool. And the dam means that the dams there will not be able to deliver water downstream. If we do not correct course and do not take serious action on the Colorado River, that is a risk, absolutely. All the way down to the Colorado through the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Perhaps. This report to me reads like a real reckoning and the experts uh, know their stuff. They've, they're mm -hmm. prominent. You guys have been doing this for decades. Uh, what should that mean for consumers, for folks who live here? How is this moment different? It's different because we depend on water from this river throughout the region. Our cities, all of the big cities that you can name in the Southwest, uh, rely on Colorado River water. And so it, we're facing an imminent crisis, a shortage, and we need to work together to figure out the solutions to that. That would be ideal. So uh, an imminent, imminent crisis, shortage, people have heard that before. Put a finer, give us some finer details about what that means. Well, for context, the amount of water behind Lake Powell and Lake Mead, or in Lake Powell and Lake Mead, is basically at historic lows. And yeah, we've been at that point before. To your point, a couple of years ago, we were, we had, we had almost no storage left on the Colorado River system, but then it snowed, right? And that bought us some time. But here we are again at square one, and what's different this time is that we're also facing the expiration of the guidelines for how Lake Powell and Lake Mead are operated. So that just introduces a huge amount of uncertainty into the system that, that wasn't there before. It's interesting because uh, two years ago this month, Tom Bruschotsky, Arizona's Water Resources Director, was sitting in that chair and offering a very dire prediction. Mm -hmm. and you just told us why it didn't come to pass because we got snow. Yeah. But it's also because at that time we had programs in place under those guidelines for taking steps to prevent catastrophe. So we had programs that helped water users save water in Lake Mead. Those programs are going away without new guidelines put into place. Yeah. And all, as well, there was a lot of money over the last couple of years, billions of dollars mm -hmm. thrown at these right. programs, is any of that money left? So that money is still being deployed. Um, the Trump administration has kept that funding in place, but there's real uncertainty about what comes next. And so I'm going to quote from the report. It says, we are in an era screaming for new ideas and new approaches. The status quo isn't working. You both offered a solution uh, in your chapter that might not be very popular. No. Sarah, just give us an outline. Sure. Well, we make the argument that paying people to temporarily leave their water uh, in, in the reservoirs isn't a long-term solution. The only long-term solution is to retire demand. Most demand comes from agricultural use, 70 to 80% of demand in the Colorado Basin. And so the solution is voluntary retirement of agricultural lands. And we argue that the federal government needs to take the lead with this. 
Retirement's a nice word for <coughs> reductions. Yeah, it's... It, no, no more deliveries of water? There are different ways it could be done. Uh, there could be farmers in some parts of this vast Colorado watershed who would be happy to uh, receive a payment to stop farming their lands. Receive a payment, so we're still in the business no, a of... Permanent, for permanently retiring their lands from agriculture. Mm -hmm. Lots of farmers have parts of their lands that are less productive than others, and so maybe they could retire their less productive parts of their land. We cite in our report, we cite a study by an agronomist at the University of Arizona, George Frisbold, who's done a kind of assessment of the different values of agricultural land throughout the basin. Not surprisingly, there are big differences the lands down in the southwest, in Yuma, in California, are very high value agricultural lands. The lands up in the upper basin tend to be much lower value. That isn't a great place to grow food and fiber. That isn't a great compared place. Compared with the, the lower basin. Okay. The report says we're out of options, basically either going to count on snowpack or reductions. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. Yeah, there, there's really very few tools left. Um, if the Secretary of the Interior can uh, bring water down from Flaming Gorge, which is in the upper basin, um, and there's a, a large amount of water in Flaming Gorge Reservoir, um, so that could be brought down to help prop up water in Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Um, and that's been done before. That was done a couple of years ago. Some water was brought down, and that, that kind of helps bolster the system. But then eventually, if and when it snows again, you got to refill Flaming Gorge as well. So it's kind of a, it's a one-time opportunity, and then you have to refill that water. So that's a, that is something that can be done. The, the secretary can also um, very um, deeply reduce the amount of water that is delivered from Lake Powell into Lake Mead. Um, and that would induce large shortages here in the lower basin. Um, but yeah, though, you know, there's not a lot of options left. Uh, if it doesn't snow, we're going to have to take really unpleasant actions. Okay, bring that home to folks, viewers, live in home, big subdivisions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good for what people. What does that mean what, to them? People want to know, can we do something? And yes, it is always helpful, particularly to your own water provider, to conserve water, to get to become more efficient and use less water. That helps your water provider uh, make do more with less water. Uh, but cities cannot conserve their way out of this crisis. It's mm -hmm. going to require more. And I think, you know, what we need is is to really demand action at a federal level, at a top state level, that will permanently address. The, the over allocation of water in the Colorado River. And that's the argument you've been making. Too much water is being taken out of the river. We have to adjust that. That's right. We need a long-term solution, not these temporary fixes that keep us on the edge of crisis. And if cities can't conserve their way out of this, can they charge their way out of this in terms of higher water rates? Well, they're, they're probably going to have to. Um, I think the era of cheap water in the West is over. Um, and it's really important. You know, you ask what people can do. People can support their municipal water provider. Um, their municipal water providers are going to have to increase rates, um, are going to have to probably acquire uh, more expensive supplies. But that's something that we need to do as a society if we're going to continue to have safe, reliable water deliveries on tap. We have an election coming up next year. One question people should ask candidates for governor, for Congress, uh, regarding what they're going to do uh, about this. I think it, if we're talking about people running for governor or Congress, I think we should ask them, what are they going to do? Do they support uh, collective action in the form of federal action to address what's going on? And yeah. higher water and, rates. And, that, and, that's a tough one. And it's it in, the, in the era of affordability. Yeah. We're, we've taken some steps as a state to, to identify and import water supplies that aren't uh, you know, so insecure. And so supporting that effort too is really important and making sure that we do that in a smart way, not in a, a, a crisis panicked way, but in a smart, thoughtful way is going to be really important in the next decade or two. Yeah, the, the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority of Arizona is undertaking that process right now. And, and, and that's a good process to support that m might put some options on the table that are more palatable to us than involuntary cuts and and things like that. Mm -hmm. All right. yeah. Got to end it there. Sarah Porter, Catherine Sorensen, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you.